Okay, welcome back to our 77th session together, going through the Desire of Ages. That means we're within 10 chapters of the end of the book. And as you can see, we're digging in to the final scenes of Christ's life, Christ's ministry. He has gone through the trial uh, before Caiaphas and Annas, and uh, now he is uh, being presented before Pilate. And so this chapter is called In Pilate's Judgment Hall. Welcome back to Michelle. It's been a, a treat getting to have her here a few nights. We've still got our babysitters at <laughs> well, home. This is the last night. <laughs> this this will be our last chance. So we'll <laughs> we'll see if we can get her back on here before we, we finish up. Um, well, why don't you uh, lead us in a prayer as we begin? Well, I guess we can do our, our subtitle. So uh, in full disclosure, we have... Uh, uh, put our heads together to come up with this. Fair enough. Are yeah, we going to stick with the same, the same one? one? All right. Yeah. Fair enough. Because I liked yours. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I told her what mine was, and she was like, "Yeah, that's that's nice." So I was like, "Okay, we're gonna have to dig a little deeper here." <laughs> so we uh, we spent some time discussing it together, and the subtitle that we both decided on is "Light in Darkness." Go ahead and have a word of prayer for us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for um, this this lengthy chapter that that really points out um, a significant contrast, uh, just as big a contrast as, as can exist. And so, um, Lord, please help us to help portray that. Help our hearts, each one of us that's watching, um, and Nathan and I right now, help us to sense the enormity of this, the difference between light and darkness, between heaven and earth. And we just ask that we would represent you at all times, Lord. May we learn to be like Christ is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I went ahead and, and highlighted the second paragraph. So we are in page 722, paragraph 2. It says, after condemning Jesus, the council of the Sanhedrin had come to Pilate to have the sentence confirmed and executed. But these Jewish officials would not enter the Roman judgment hall. According to their ceremonial law, they would be, they would de be defiled thereby and thus prevented them from, ta prevented from taking part in the feast of the Passover. In their blindness, they did not see that murderous hatred had defiled their hearts. They did not see that Christ was the real Passover lamb and that since they had rejected him, the great feast had for them lost its significance. I mean, can you imagine? It's uh, so ironic. <laughs> it's uh, really terrifying here yeah. that they are, huh, they're hastening on to make sure that they can kill the Son of God uh, and they're doing it quickly because they're wanting to be able to keep the Sabbath. And it's a high Sabbath because it's the the combination of both the Passover as well as a regular weekly Sabbath. And um, so they are trying to not defile themselves in their rituals and rites and in, in their ceremonial uh, sense, but uh, not realizing that what defiles a man is what's taking place in their hearts. And it uh, just shows that contrast between the, uh, to f well, false religion and true religion. Mm -hmm. False religion focusing on the outside and true religion focusing on the, the attitudes of the heart. Which shows to the outside. That's what we see really in this contrast is Christ being everything that God and heaven is. And the contrast is all the others, the crowd, the the people in charge, the, the Pharisees and the rulers being fully evil i mean this is this is the last moments satan is doing his biggest hurrah i mean he's trying to to force christ to make a mistake absolutely and the the nature of somebody's character the true essence of their being is shown most accurately uh in the darkest moments in the most difficult moments mm. and so we see in this chapter that jesus is a beautiful character shows uh, so brightly as mm -hmm. as he's being surrounded by these mocking jeering hating uh, malicious crowds 
So let's uh, let's go down here to 725 or 724 paragraph 1, picking it up in the second sentence. It says, uh, he had had to deal with all kinds this of pilot criminals. That we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But never before had a man bearing marks of such goodness and nobility been brought before him. On his face, he saw no sign of guilt, no expression of fear, no boldness or defiance. He saw a man, a man of calm and dignified bearing, whose countenance bore not the marks of a criminal, but the signature of heaven. That was my first subtitle was signature of heaven. Yeah. Because I, I think that's, that's really impressive too, to try to own what, when we go somewhere, what do we want on our face? Mm. We want the signature of heaven. Amen. What does that mean? You find that out through the rest of the chapter. What, what was it Pilate saw? Well, we're going to find out. Beautiful. Christ's appearance made a favorable impression upon Pilate. His better nature was roused. He had heard of Jesus and his works. His wife had told him something of the wonderful deeds performed by the Galilean prophet who cured the sick and raised the dead. So here we're, we're get, catching a glimpse of the, the character of Jesus and that this was uh, apparent in his very appearance, that, exactly. his, that his presence uh, brought it, with it this. And at this point, you know, he hasn't been beaten beyond recognition, but he's, he's been swatted around by the, the previous people. But yet behind uh, maybe some of this bruising and some of this uh, marring of his outward appearance, he still has a, a beauty that is unmistakable. And imagine he roused, um, the better nature was roused of Pilate mm -hmm. by just the appearance of Christ. So when I read this book years and years ago, I mean, I, I don't know when I wrote this next to, next to these words, but mm -hmm. I wrote, that's the way we should make people feel. Amen. They should have that same, like whew, this favorable impression is made and they look, wow. And that it kind of draws out the best in others as well. Yeah, that's so when, when, that's when we're bringing out the worst in people, we we should pause and be like, hmm, <laughs> what spirit do I have? Am I bringing out <laughs> yeah. the worst in people? Yeah, fair enough, absolutely. Huh. Okay, so I I went ahead and uh, marked down down here at uh, seven twenty six, paragraph one. It says Pilate saw through their purpose. Speaking of the purpose of the the priests and wanting to falsely accuse and, and to crucify Jesus. He did not believe that the prisoner had plotted against the government. His meek and humble appearance was altogether out of harmony with, that, with the charge. Pilate was convinced that a deep plot had been laid to destroy an innocent man who should in the way of Jewish dignitaries. Turning to Jesus, he asked, Art thou the king of the Jews? The Savior answered, Thou sayest it. And he spoke, his countenance lighted up as of a sunbeam were shining upon it. As if a sunbeam were shining upon it. So here we go. We, we see again this beautiful countenance uh, that Jesus had, this aura. Later on it says, and I can't remember if I highlighted it or not, but it was though he had a, a faint light surrounding his head. And in each one of these contexts, he's moved from Pilate's, Court, uh, courtroom to then Herod's and then back. And each one of these contexts, the, she reiterates these same, uh, these same things. The, the abuses and all of this darkness, she says it, it didn't touch him. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you think you know, he's getting spit upon, he's getting hmm. wrestled around and pushed, but it, mm. but it didn't, the waves that are beating upon him, it didn't touch him. Mm -hmm. That's just neat. And yeah, it's right, right down here. He just had this. Oh, go ahead. Read that for okay. us. So it says. Um, Where, so that would be. Two, 726 paragraph 1, 2, 3. Okay. Uh, so I'm just jumping into the middle of it here. His whole bearing gave evidence of conscious in innocence. He stood unmoved by the fury of the waves that beat about him. It was as if the heavy surges of wrath rising higher and higher, like the waves of the boisterous ocean, broke about him, but did not touch him. Mm-hmm. Whew, like a like a lighthouse that just it's not gonna yeah. wear out the waves, but nothing's gonna happen to the lighthouse. Mm. He stood silent, but his silence was eloquence. Beautiful. It was as a shining light from the inner to the outer man. 
I love it. There's the light. Into, isn't that cool? I'm really glad you picked that. Yeah. And, and there's kind of the, you know, that, that paragraph really illustrates that. So uh, when does light shine the brightest? It shines the brightest in the darkest of circumstances. And so we wouldn't have seen the depths of the love of Christ. We wouldn't have seen the, his true peace, the peace that passes all understanding. Uh, we wouldn't have comprehended the light as, as fully if it had not been shown in the darkest of, of times. It gives hope to anyone who's going through dark times too. Mm-hmm. Christ has been there. Can you put yourself in Christ's place in this chapter? Imagine being in his situation. It's just incredible, his mm. testimony in this chapter. Absolutely beautiful. And I love that last sentence. It was as a light shining from the inner to the outer man. And that's, that's true gospel. We've, we've talked about one of the subtitles I gave one of our chapters talking about uh, Matthew 23 with the, the woes to the Pharisees was uh, inward glow, not outward show. Mm. And we see that inward glow, that it's shining forth as the, the outer man. Uh, Paul said something along these, these lines. As the outer man is wasting away, the inner man is growing stronger day by day. Uh, something along those lines. And mm-hmm. that, that, uh, that, yeah, when our eyes are fixed on not this world, but the world to come, when our eyes are turned off of worldly uh, glamour and ambition and put place on heaven... It's amazing. It's it's that dichotomy of the first shall be last, the last shall be first. The one that seeks to save his life will lose it. The one that loses it will save it. It's this this uh, in my weakness, right? In my weakness, he is strong. Therefore, will I glory in my weakness? And so, as Jesus's body is being wasted away in throughout this this story, this last these last moments of, of his. Uh, his earthly ministry, we see his his inner being shining forth all the brighter. That's the a, nature. A paradigm, like heaven's paradigm being different than ours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That next paragraph, last sentence I put, art thou the king of the Jews? This is the question that Pilate is um, putting to Jesus. And Jesus said, Jesus did not directly answer this question, He knew that the Holy Spirit was striving with Pilate, and he gave him opportunity to acknowledge his conviction. Sayest thou this thing of thyself, he asked, or did others tell it to thee of me? That is, what is the accusations of the priests, or uh, that is, what is the accusations of the priest, or a desire to receive light from Christ that prompted Pilate's question? Pilate understood Christ's meaning, but pride arose in his heart. He would not acknowledge the conviction that passed upon him. Uh, I, this has been kind of a, a, a joy that I've been realizing as I've been going through this book, is just realizing how the Holy Spirit works. Hmm. And so we see the Holy Spirit that uh, Jesus understood, uh, the, the second sentence there, he knew that the Holy Spirit was striving with Pilate. And so the words that Jesus spoke were in, in tandem, were in orchestra, were uh, to, to assist and be part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So he, he's speaking to the heart. He's trying to uh, break down any barriers. He's trying to mm-hmm. cut to the quick and allow the, the Holy Spirit's work to... Uh, to bring about conversion in, in Pilate's heart. And really, any minister, that should be always the, the priority. Not so much to answer the, the ponderings of the intellect, mm. but to uh, answer the, the desires of the heart, you know, reach to, into the, the convicting elements of, of the As a man thinks of his heart, so is he. If you reach the heart, you have him. Yeah, and I so mean, we see, especially if they yield, then you, you have I, the whole exactly. Person. We see Pilate's resistance of the work of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. but it's beautiful that the Holy Spirit is striving with Pilate. It's interesting that even later on in the chapter it talks about how Jesus had prayed that an angel would bring a message to his wife to warn him, 
And so uh, at a very critical time, a messenger comes with a note from his wife saying, don't condemn this man. This man is an innocent man. And it just shows the mercy of God, that mm-hmm. he's wanting Pilate to be fully warned mm-hmm. about this, uh, this grievous And the dream he gives this woman. We don't even know who this woman is. We do know that she had told Pilate some about Christ. So she's someone who's been watching Jesus. Mm-hmm. But she has quite the dream. I mean, it is oh, impressive. It's, it's, it's she extensive. saw the second coming. It's, a, it's extensive, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that doesn't happen that a whole lot that, that we know of. Mm-hmm. It just makes this woman someone that's intriguing. Mm, that was very and, blessed. And you don't consider her accountable for any of this. So, I mean, she might be someone we see in heaven. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that next uh, paragraph is, is interesting. It says, Pilate's golden opportunity had passed. And that's, that brings us back to that. Uh, it's a Philippians chapter 2. It talks about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then mm-hmm. the next verse says, because it's God that works in you both to will and to do of, of his good pleasure. And so these moments of conviction, these moments of uh, uh, realization of awakening, mm are not things that we're orchestrating, not things that we're initiating. Hmm. And so these moments, Pilate's golden opportunity had passed because the opportunity of a lifetime must be grasped during the lifetime of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. He missed that opportunity to respond to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, and so he, he has more opportunities later on, but his golden moment, he could have right here early on in the story, he could have shifted his uh his approach uh down here in 727 paragraph 2 the last sentence the last two sentences to this end was i born and for this cause came i into the world that i should bear witness unto the truth everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice says jesus responding to Pilate. now uh skipping down two paragraphs from there paragraph four says Pilate had a desire to know the truth. Mm. His mind was confused. He eagerly grasped the words of the Savior, and his heart was stirred with a great longing to know what it really was and how he could obtain it. What is truth? He inquired, but he did not wait for an answer. The tumult outside recalled him to the interests of the hour, for the priests were clamorous for immediate action Going out to the Jews, he declared emphatically, I find in him no fault at all. So he is, he's asking deep questions. He's wanting to get at the truth, and yet he's letting the, the distractions of the moment uh, take away from the, the real question at hand. 728 paragraph 2, uh, going down about halfway through the paragraph, it says, When he heard that Christ was from Galilee, he decided to send him to Herod, the ruler of the province, who was then in Jerusalem. By this course, Pilate thought to shift the responsibility of the trial from himself to Herod. Don't we all do that? Yeah. We have a burning in our heart. We have a conviction sometimes, and something gets placed right in our hand. We're like, "Eh, who can I uh, throw this to? Pass this off to, yeah. He's trying to find a way to weasel out of it without losing face. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't turn out so well. So 730, paragraph 3. This is uh, after he spent his time with Herod. Uh, he's actually still in the, in the middle of it here, but it says that the mission of Christ in this world was not to gratify idle curiosity. Mm-hmm. He came to heal the brokenhearted. Could he have spoken any words to heal the bruises of a sin-sick soul, of, of sin-sick souls, he would not have kept silent. Mm, I love that part. But he had no words for these who would, uh, for those who would trample the truth under their unholy feet. Yeah, I, I just find that to be significant. If you have a sin sick soul, you know, if if you are broken hearted, he will talk to you. Mm-hmm. No matter he the won't, circumstance, he won't. He won't stay silent. Claim it, like. When you read these chapters, this is not just a history lesson. This can be your present uh, scenario. Mm. So to put a heart around it, circle it, memorize it. And sometime when you're the in the most darkest moment, 
that's the moment you have to cling to Christ. That's the moment you can say, Lord, you <clears throat> promise you'll speak to a broken heart. Mm -hmm. I have a broken heart. You'll speak to me. Amen. That's just exciting. That is powerful. Could he have spoken any word to heal the bruises of a sin sick soul? He would not remain silent. That's that's powerful. Which tells you that any, that crowd any opportunity. there was mostly there was just darkness because he doesn't open his mm -hmm. mouth. Yeah. Uh, Herod is wanting him to show him a sign, but it's because he's curious, not because he's convicted. D are you planning to make any note of this? Can I read through this real quickly? Yeah, that looks like you've got it right highlighted right where I, I oh, have okay, it too. Perfect. So go ahead. Go ahead and read that. Where do you want me to start? Uh, I have it. Herod had rejected the truth. Yeah, that's good. Herod had rejected the truth spoken to him by the greatest of the prophets, which was John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And no other message was he to receive. Woo. Hmm. Not a word had the majesty of heaven for him. That ear that had ever been open to human woe had no room for Herod's commands. Those eyes that had ever rested upon the penitent sinner in pitying, forgiving love had no look to bestow on Herod. Those lips that had uttered the most impressive truth, that in tones of tenderest entreaty had pleaded with the most sinful and most degraded, hmm. were closed to the haughty king who felt no need of a savior. I just find that so clear, so distinct. So mm -hmm. you, it's something you can just... It's kind of poetic. Uh, mm -hmm. You see a contrast from how he had always been to, you see boundaries even. You see Jesus has this way with everyone and yet not for Herod. It's interesting. It just is something yeah, to comment on. It, it, oh, no, I think that's one of the best paragraphs in this chapter. It's beautiful. And the, yeah, that penitent sinner in pitying, forgiving love had no look to bestow upon Herod. It is, uh, Jesus was interested in saving souls. He was interested in, in meet, meeting the needs of those that felt their need. Mm -hmm. And so this haughty king felt no need, and so it didn't call forth the, uh, the sympathy of, of the Savior. And if we go down to 731, paragraph 3, it gives us another one of these uh, very strong contrast mm. uh, paragraphs. So I'm picking up about halfway through the paragraph. It says, while the rude throng were bowing in mockery, or bowing, I'm sorry, uh, were, were bowing in mockery before him, some who came forward for that purpose turned back, mm -hmm. afraid and silenced. Herod was convicted. The last rays of merciful light were shining upon his sin-hardened heart. He felt that this was no common man, for divinity had flashed through humanity. At the very time when Christ was encompassed by mockers, adulterers, and murderers, Herod felt that he was beholding a God upon his throne. Isn't that just incredible language? Mm -hmm. Could more potent words be employed? I don't think so. I mean, I just think this was written perfectly. Yeah, it's This is as close as you get to actually being there yourself in Pilate's Judgment Hall. Yeah, it's so here's that light shines the brightest in darkness. The contrast between the mockers, adulterers, and murderers mm -hmm. makes Jesus shine all the brighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, powerful. Let's see. So going down this next pair or two paragraphs down. So 731 paragraph five, last uh, two sentences. It said, he had sent Jesus to Herod. Now he's coming back, right? Uh, Jesus is being brought to Pilate. And uh, the Tetrarch of Galilee and one of their own nation, but he also had found in him nothing worthy of death. I will therefore chastise him, Pilate said, and release him. Here Pilate showed his weakness. Mm. He had declared that Jesus was innocent, yet he was willing for him to, uh, to be scourged to pacify his accusers. He would sacrifice justice and principle in order to compromise with the mob. Mm. This placed him at a disadvantage. The crowd presumed upon his indecision and clamored the more for the life of the prisoner. If the first pilot, if, if at first pilot had stood firm, refusing to condemn a man whom he found guiltless, he would have broken the fatal chain that was to bind him in remorse and guilt as long as he lived. Mm. 
skipping down a couple of sentences, it says, but Pilate had taken step after step in the violation of his conscience. He had excused himself from judging with justice and equity, and he now found himself almost helpless in the hands of the priests and rulers. His wavering and indecision proved his ruin. And this ties to the the original title the, you had the subtitle the yeah yeah creeping compromise was the the other subtitle that i'd given this chapter and uh, there you see it you see this he, because early on in the chapter he's wavering and uh it causes the uh a problem here he again compromises and uh it reminds me of you know the uh, previous chapter uh, let's see i'm trying to remember it was the one um where peter denies Jesus. Mm, mm. And uh, Ellen White talks about had he, you know, John stood a distance from the crowd and he didn't put on any pretense. Mm -hmm. They all knew he was a disciple. Yeah. But Peter had gone close to the crowd and he had been trying to fang. He was trying trying to to, blend in. He was trying to blend in. He was trying to cover his identity. He was trying to to, uh, uh, mask his interest in, in the Savior. And in that, Ellen White says that he was putting himself on the enemy's t- ground. How often do we do this? Do we do we unmistakably hold a line of I'm I'm on heaven's side and I'm not coming as close to the line as I can get. Mm-hmm. I'm not playing with Satan. I'm I'm on Christ's side. I mean, That's telling huge. ourselves that every day when you step out of your home, Lord, I don't want to be on the devil's territory. That's huge, and and so it's. Uh, I've heard it described as uh, cutting them, cutting sin off at the pass, <laughs> where you're you're not even letting it get into the, yeah you're, you're you're making sure that it's cut off before it has an opportunity of of tempting you. And John was the only one. I, I want to be that one. You know, there's so many. They're nervous. They're afraid. They're that Christ is used to that. And he says, "Oh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak." But John pressed toward Jesus, didn't try to stay away. Mm-hmm. Be that disciple for Christ. He, he needs it. Beautiful. Yeah, oh, that creep, creeping compromise. So having making that bold stance, you know, Jesus said that he who denies me in front of man will I also deny before my, my Father in heaven. And so mm. having that, that resolute stance to say, no, I, I'm not going to deny him. And I have a great tendency, and I think a lot of us struggle with the tendency to uh, to be people pleasers, to want to make everybody happy. If there's any way that we can compromise and make everybody happy, then that's always the route that I prefer. Um, and yet sometimes it's not about making everybody happy, especially when you're seeing the the demonic mm-hmm. manifestations that you're seeing in this mm-hmm. chapter. It's not a time you to make to people a, happy. Pick a position on heaven's side and you have to hold your ground. Yeah, yeah that's true. 735 paragraph 4 says, there stood the Son of God wearing the robe of mockery. Skipping some good stuff, but I know we got to go. We can't stay here all night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there stood the Son of God wearing the robe of mockery and the crown of thorns, stripped to the waist. His back showed the long, cruel stripes from which the blood flowed freely. His face was stained with blood and bore the marks of exhaustion and pain. But never had it been a never had it appeared more beautiful than now. The Savior's visage was not marred before his enemies. Every feature expressed gentleness and resignation, and the tenderest pity for his cruel foes. Wow. In his manner there was no cowardly weakness, but the strength and dignity of long suffering. In striking contrast with the prisoner at his side, every line of the countenance of Barabbas proclaimed him the hardened ruffian that he was. The contrast spoke to every beholder. I love that line. Some of the spectators were weeping. Mm. As they looked upon Jesus, their hearts were full of sympathy. Even the priests, the rulers, were convicted that he was all he claimed to be. Isn't that incredible? Wow. Wow. That's why they're without excuse. That's why there's kind of a special resurrection Mm -hmm. before Jesus comes. For those that pierced him. Exactly. They get to see him coming in the clouds. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, that's so powerful. When we look down here at 738, paragraph 1, 
a uh, few sentences in. It's, I just picked out one sentence here. It says, In the vast sea of upturned faces, his alone was peaceful. And so there you see, and, and yeah, this is, I was wondering if I highlighted this. I didn't, but it's right after the sentence says, but at his, uh, about his head, a soft light seemed to shine. Pilate said in his heart, he is God. Mm. So here's this contrast. He's shining so brightly. His character is being manifested in a way that, that the onlookers can't deny. They can't deny that he is not of man. <laughs> he is God. And that he is he is akin to God, and so um, Pilate at this point washes his hands and says and asks even for forgiveness mm. from from Jesus. And uh, here in seven thirty eight paragraph two it says Pilate longed to deliver Jesus, but he saw that he could not do this and yet retain his own position and honor. Oh, how heart sickening is that? So, yeah, there's why you can't be lovers of money and Mm. lovers of Christ. Mm. You cannot serve two masters. Rather than lose his worldly power, he chose to sacrifice an innocent life. How many, to escape loss or suffering, in like manner sacrifice principle? Conscience and duty point one one way, and self-interest points another. Light and darkness again. Mm-hmm. Choose ye this day who you're going to serve. The current sets strongly in the wrong direction, and he who compromises with evil is swept away with the thick darkness of guilt. So there's that word compromise again. Mm-hmm. Going on, it says, Pilate yielded to the demands of the mob. Rather than risk losing his position, he delivered Jesus up to be crucified. But in spite of his precautions, the very thing he dreaded afterward came upon him. His honors were stripped from him. He was cast down from the high office and, stung by remorse and wounded by pride not long after the crucifixion, he ended his own life. So all who compromise with sin will gain only sorrow and ruin. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs fourteen twelve. Hmm. Huh. So the of course the story you're probably familiar with. You know Barabbas is set up in front. You know he, Pilate's trying to find a way to be able to graciously save face and also save Jesus, and uh, the crowd is not having it. They want Jesus at at any means, uh, any any cost. And uh, there's a powerful paragraph here that Ellen White draws the in them choosing Barabbas over Jesus. Mm -hmm. They made a decision here. And at 738 paragraph 5, it says, The people of Israel had made their choice. Pointing to Jesus, they had said, Not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas, the robber and murderer, was the representative of Satan. Christ was the representative of God. Christ had been rejected. Barabbas had been chosen. I just had a thought. Mm. I wonder if John, who's watching this closely, if this didn't paint a picture in his mind that creates his opening words in the book of John. The light and darkness and the world chose darkness. Mm. Wow. He yeah, saw. That's powerful. He, I mean, he, he really saw this scene. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And, and he even starts his epistle. Uh, that God is light. And, and in him is no darkness. And, and in, mm-hmm. in him is no darkness at all. And that those that follow him will walk in the light as he is in the light. And uh, yeah, but that's exactly right. Yeah, that's I'd the never beginning. That he, he starts John, starts his epistle, or not his epistle, but his gospel, mm-hmm. with that uh, the light shone in the darkness, that darkness did not comprehend it. And uh, yeah, here here it is. They're choosing darkness over light. Yeah. Why? Because, and I, I, it might describe it right here. It says, uh, representative of God, Christ had been rejected. Barabbas had been chosen. Barabbas, they were to have. In making his this choice, they accepted him who from the beginning was a liar and a murderer. Wow, that just shows the insanity of mankind. It shows that... Uh, yeah. Depravity of the heart. They saw the difference between these two men. Christ was innocent. He had a godlike bearing mm-hmm. as if God is on his throne and he had an innocence that just, 
He, he had dignity. He wasn't afraid. He was, I mean, it, he had a glow about him. How do you pick a murderous thief over Christ? Yeah, and it was because their hearts, it, just like Jesus tells the, the Pharisees in John chapter 8, he says, you're, you think your father is Abraham, but your father, father is actually Satan. He was a liar from the beginning and a murderer, the father of lies. And uh, so here's, uh, you know, she's almost referencing that here, that uh, uh, they accepted. In making this choice, they accepted him whom from the beginning was a liar and a murderer. Satan was their leader. As a nation, they would act out his dictation. His works, they would do. His rule, they must endure. Wow. That uh, that people who chose Barabbas in the place of Christ were to feel the cruelty of Barabbas as long as time should last. That's kind of a prophetic statement there. Yeah, and it's, it's showing that they had chosen Satan as their leader. And in the same sense that Adam and Eve... Mm -hmm. chose to follow mm -hmm. Lucifer over Christ. And all of the, the havoc and pain and heartbreak that we see in our world is a result of that choice, of that uh, allowing our hearts to be then corrupted and molded to the government of Satan, which is governed by selfishness. And so everything, every other evil comes in the wake of that, that shift. Mm -hmm. the, the good news is every good comes in the wake of, of our redemption comes in the wake of our uh, our being born again into and our tastes change wouldn't you say we begin to to like what it is that what path we start on we begin to appreciate and get deeper in we get more entrenched mm -hmm. and if you're on the path with satan you begin to actually despise the good and jesus seems so yep. beautiful and so wonderful but his beauty showed how evil they all were and so there's this tendency for humans to want to squelch whatever gives them conviction. Absolutely. Yeah, there was a paragraph in there that talked about why the the rulers, right? Why the Sanhedrin hated Jesus so much. And it was because his righteousness made their mockery of of religion uh, appear to be the fraud that it was. Mm. And so they had to get rid of him in order to maintain their position, maintain their and their traditions. Their traditions. And so yeah, oh, the same when we allow ourselves to compromise with evil, when we allow ourselves to to be, um, when we don't stand firm, when we don't stand tall, when we don't uh, uh, make Jesus our all in and all, our all in all, to to fix our eyes upon Him, and uh, yeah, I, th I think there was a lot of beautiful lessons in here, and and we really see the character of God being contrasted mm -hmm. with the wickedness of Satan. Mm -hmm. And in the, the choice between Jesus and Barabbas, we see that the human heart <laughs> will choose wickedness over righteousness if, if it's left to its, uh, its uh, own tendencies. We see time and time again that e the people are being um, convicted. They're being awakened. They're, they're seeing a different angle but they are so engrossed in their traditions and in, in their wickedness and their selfishness that, the, that they, press, they press on anyways. And uh, when we seek temporal glory, we find death instead. And uh, it reminds me of that, that verse in first, uh, first John. In fact, I'm turned to it right now says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Amen. So we see Jesus doing the will of God in the midst of this, this mockery. And, uh, and so he had a calm serenity when everybody else was being driven by uh, satanic agencies. And why? Because he did not love the world. And so when the world was being stripped away from him, it, did, it mattered not. Is there any last uh, words you want to share before we... It's just she says exactly that 
he departed, Jesus departed in no particular from the will of his father. That's on page 735. And so I think... Mm, read, read that that whole little section there. So it says, Satan's rage was great as he saw that all the abuse he inflicted upon the Savior had not forced the least murmur from his lips, from Christ's lips. Mm-hmm. Although he had taken upon him the nature of man, he was sustained by a godlike fortitude and departed in no particular from the will of his Father. I think that's very, very powerful and significant. And it makes me think back on Gethsemane when Jesus yields himself. Uh, We're told in James chapter 4 that uh, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That that submitting to God, Mm -hmm. that's where we find, that's where when we become immovable, that's when we become strong. Amen. is when we're completely surrendered to God. And so even though Jesus could barely walk <laughs> as he staggers over and kneels down before before God and begs for the the cup to be removed from him, that's, you know, we see him in his humanity there. And then God sends an angel and the angel gives him strength. Mm-hmm. And because his his will, he had hid his will in the will of his father. Now there was nothing, nothing in all of heaven and earth that could snatch him away from the hand of his father. And not all of the evil could, and the same is true for us. When Mm. we are in the palm of Christ and we have submitted our will completely to him. And so, as Jesus said, that he's come to sift me. He's Mm. come to, Mm. but he has no found nothing in him he has found nothing in me there was Mm. nothing that that drew satan or drew christ into satan's plots uh, and deceptions because he he uh he had fully and perfectly submitted his will to the father Amen. huh so let's uh let's have a word of prayer let's uh uh thank thank you father for this testimony of your firmness and your serenity and your peace in the midst of a mockery in the midst of cruelty in the in the midst of uh, pride and insurrection mm-hmm. and severity so father we we're grateful that when we look into your face even though the storm is raging around us we see peace and we see tenderness Amen. we see kindness And so in the darkness of this world, may we turn our eyes upon Jesus and allow his uh, his character, his nature to become our anchor. That we too, as we yield ourselves into his in his watch care, may we find in you, Jesus, may we find the same serenity and peace in the midst of a wicked world. We thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We will see you tomorrow. And uh, we'll see if we can get Michelle back on here before all all is said and done. But (laughs) we're now moving into the last 10 chapters of The Desire of Ages.